So how many of you recognize that little tune? Recognize it? Did it make you want to sing along just a little bit? I think we should try, Sarah. Ready? With me now? It's a That was very good, by the way. I didn't expect that. I was afraid I'd be all by myself. But it says, I've always wanted to have a neighbor just like you. I've always wanted to live in a neighborhood with you. Let's make the most of this beautiful day. Since we're together, we might as well stay. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? Would, won't you be my neighbor? Well, how many of you remember having that show on in your house at some point in the past? Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Well, that was the way the show started every single day. You can put that photo up of Mr. Rogers. There he is. That's the way the show started every single day. Uh, he would walk in the door, start singing that little song, and then, remember what he did next? He'd take off his jacket, put on his sweater, zip it up, back down a little bit, his zip-on cardigan sweater, uh, and then he would walk over and, by the way, did you know his mother knitted all his sweaters? And one of them is actually hanging in the Smithsonian, that's hard to say, Smithsonian Institute today. That's amazing. And then he would take off his loafers, put on his sneakers, and then the show would begin. Uh, Fred Rogers, between 1968 and 2001, produced 895 episodes of his little show. He wrote almost all of the scripts. He wrote almost all of the music. He voiced most of the characters. Uh, and in fact, he, you could say that he raised, helped raise a whole generation of American children. And he did so because uh, he, had, he was once an ordained Presbyterian minister. And when he was introduced to television in the late 50s, he believed, uh, he was called to use that new medium as an opportunity to make something healthier for children. I mean, to create a show that he, where he could teach them about love and anger and sadness and forgiveness. Uh, you can make an argument that Fred Rogers, in his way, changed the world just a little bit. And I think you could also make an argument that Fred Rogers was simply trying to take something that Jesus taught 2,000 years ago and turn it into an everyday television show. So today we begin a series that will last us about a month called Won't You Love Your Neighbor? And over the next four weeks, we're going to look at what Jesus had to say about loving our neighbors. We'll look at it in four ways. The command to love our neighbors, uh, the call to love our neighbors, the cost of loving our neighbors, and then the celebration of loving our neighbors. Today we're going to begin with the command. Now we're going to be in Luke chapter 10 today. So if you want to look in your Bible, you can do that, or we'll just have the words on the screen. But before I read the passage to you, let me give you a little bit of background. At this point in Luke's Gospel, Jesus has been um, in his public ministry for somewhere around three years. He's on his way toward Jerusalem, uh, which will culminate, of course, with um, his trial and with uh, the crucifixion and with his resurrection. <laughs> But he's already become enormously popular through his public ministry. But his teaching has not been without controversy. In fact, he's, he's made some enemies uh, because he's been teaching that the kingdom of God is not primarily about the external observance of religious law. He's been teaching that the kingdom of God is about the internal transformation of the heart that he liked to call being born again. And so he's, and he's openly identified himself as the Son of God and has called people to follow him. As a result, he's developed very serious and powerful enemies. Uh, those who saw him as a threat uh, to their uh, position, to their way of life, to their religion, and they called him a false prophet and sometimes uh, worse things than that. So Luke chapter 10, we pick up this little story. Luke writes, On one occasion... An expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied, do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor. Now we're going to stop there. Most of you know what comes next. 
which is the parable of the Good Samaritan. We're going to be there in a couple of weeks. But just today, we're going to look at three things in this little story. First, a loaded question, and then a loaded answer, and then a loaded challenge. So we're going to begin with a loaded question. Now, we all know what a loaded question is, right? A loaded question is a question that is, uh, has embedded in it an assumption uh, that tries to force us into giving an answer that we really don't want to give. For example, a question like, have you stopped kicking your dog? Okay? That's a loaded question, and it's actually a trap, uh, because the question, have you stopped kicking your dog, assumes that at one time you were kicking your dog. So the trap is, if you answer yes, you'll be admitting that you were kicking your dog, but now I've stopped. If you answer no, then you're saying that you kicked your dog in the past, and you've stopped kicking that, your dog now. So there's really no good answer unless you change the question entirely. Another example might be, why can't the Bears beat the Packers? <laughs> Surely you like that one, right? That, because that, that question assumes that the Bears never beat the Packers, which actually is kind of a good question when you think about it. I actually saw an article posted online just recently on social media. And here was the title of the article. Why do evangelical Christians hate Muslims? Why do evangelical Christians hate Muslims? And immediately I recognized that as a loaded question. It made me feel trapped. In fact, it made me feel, feel angry. It made me mad. Because it makes an unfair and inaccurate assumption about all evangelical Christians. I think that's what's going on here in this little story. In verse 25 we read, On one occasion an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, three things about this question. In one sense, it's a good question. In fact, it's a great question. It's a question that every single human being, I believe in some way, shape, or form, asks at some point in their life. It's a question, a fundamental question about human existence. It's a question that every major world religion attempts to answer in some way. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, it's possible that this man, who's called an expert in the law, has heard Jesus' teaching over recent months and is genuinely curious. He wants to know what Jesus thinks. But I think it's far more likely that this man already knows thinks he already knows the answer to his own question. There's a good chance he's already believed and convinced of his own righteousness. He's already believed that because he's an expert in the law, that he's already inherited eternal life. And all he's doing here is testing to see if Jesus believes what he believes. Second, the question assumes there's something that we do to inherit eternal life. And by the way, this is kind of the default mode of most people, I believe, in our, in our modern culture. If you were to ask someone on the street, they would look at you strangely, but if you were to ask someone on the street, what do you have to do to inherit eternal life? Most of them would stammer a bit and then say, well, I suppose uh, I have to be a good person. They might even say, I, I, I should try to be the best person I can be. Because their assumption is, if at the end of their lifetime, they've done more good than bad, if the good outweighs the bad, then they're good. They're okay with God. That's our current, that's the gospel of our culture. Okay? Third, in this case, it's also, I believe, a loaded question. Notice Luke says, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Now, the phrase expert in the law translates one single word in Greek, and that word's clearest definition is lawyer, all right? The expert in the law was a lawyer, and the word translated test is a word that you use when you put someone on trial. So this is a kind of religious lawyer putting Jesus on trial for what he believes and what he's been teaching about eternal life. That's what the language is telling us. And here's the trap. If Jesus answers this question by saying, you achieve eternal life, by strict obedience to the law of God. He will be contradicting much of what he's already been teaching about the kingdom of God and about himself. He's already said things like, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. So if he answers that way, he's contradicting himself. And, and he's, he's confusing his followers. But if he says, 
you receive eternal life by following me, he'll be in violation of the law, and he'll be making himself out to be a blasphemer, which, of course, is the charge that eventually got him nailed to the cross. So the expert in the law is testing Jesus, that he's setting him up to give an answer that will either discredit him to his followers or expose him as a blasphemer. And I think we hear questions kind of like this all the time with regard to our faith. For example, why do Christians think they're so much better than everybody else? I've heard that one. Why are Christians so narrow-minded in their beliefs? I've heard that one. Why is Christianity so exclusive? I've also heard that one. Now, in response to this loaded question, we notice that Jesus offers an equally loaded answer. So that's the second thing today, a loaded answer. Uh, This week when I was thinking about this, also preparing for the the parenting summit on Saturday, I remembered a little little story from earlier in our parenting journey. Um, One of our sons was getting into his, his teen years, Um, had gotten his driver's license, and naturally, at that point in life, wanted more independence. Uh, He was starting to go out with friends, starting to drive around at night, and so uh, it was very natural for that season of life to want a little more independence. And eventually, the issue of curfew came up, uh, how long he could stay out at night. Now, uh, there were two issues. One was the local town curfew, which was a, a, a statute in our town that set the curfew for those under 18 to be, I believe it was 10 p.m. on weekdays and 11 p.m. on weekends. Uh, And the second issue was our curfew, uh, mom and dad curfew, which typically was a bit earlier than the town curfew. Um, But we knew the the question was inevitable. We knew inevitably that our son would, would, would want more independence and want to stretch those limits. So we had actually talked about it and prepared a little bit for the question. And sure enough, it came, and he said, can I stay out past curfew tonight? And since we knew it, it would come, we had sort of prepared our answer, which was going to be a question. And so we said, well, our curfew for you is 10.30 on weekends. The town curfew is 11 o'clock. And after that, um, police can arrest anybody under 18 and give you a citation, which would be something like 100 bucks, which would be your responsibility. So what time seems right to you? We asked. Now, our son had never been in trouble. Uh, He had already shown he could make good decisions, so we didn't have an issue with that. So we fully expected him to stretch it and say, midnight, maybe later. And we were prepared to say, okay, because we trusted him. If he was willing to take on that risk, we were willing willing to trust him completely. But he thought about it for a minute, and he looked back at us and said, "Mm, maybe 11, he said. I think we might have high-fived after that one, because sometimes responding to a question with a question is the best track to go. The religious lawyer puts Jesus on trial by asking, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He thinks he has Jesus cornered, which is what he's trying to do, but then Jesus responds with a question of his own. Verse 26, what is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? Notice, he sends the expert in the law back to the law of God. Verse 27, he answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. So notice this Religious lawyer has no trouble at all answering Jesus' question. In fact, he quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 6. Verse 4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. That's the ancient Shema of the Jews. He had likely recited this verse every day of his adult life. Verse 5 then says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Then to his credit, he adds Leviticus 19, which says, Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. See, Jesus knows exactly what's going on. So he avoids the loaded question by forcing the religious lawyer to answer his own question. Now notice, there are two commands here. There's love God and love your neighbor. And these two commands summarize all ten of the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20. If we go through them quickly, we see the first four are all about loving God. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not not make for yourself a carved image. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And you shall remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Those first four are how we relate to God, how we love God. 
The last six are about how we live with others, including our neighbors. Honor your father and mother. You shall not steal. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And you shall not covet uh, that which belongs to your neighbor. And by the way, in Matthew chapter 22, in a very similar conversation, Jesus himself said that all the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. Love God. Love your neighbor. But notice, there are also two how-tos in these commandments. How are we to love God? With all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Okay, what does that mean? What does that mean? If I were to ask you directly, personally, have you loved God this week? I suspect almost all of you would say, yeah, yeah, I have. But if I ask, have you loved God this week with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength? Have you so loved God that nothing at all has interrupted your worship and your praise? That nothing at all has distracted you whatsoever from the glory of God or taking your thoughts away from his holiness? Not even that terrible bear scan. How would you answer? Right. Of course you haven't loved God with all your might, with all your soul. Of course not. Neither have I. That little word all is a problem for us. And then, how do we love our neighbor? As ourselves. Ourselves. I did a little research this week and thinking about this. Just typed in online uh, on, the, on, the, on the great Google search engine, um, how, how to be a good neighbor to see what's out there. I find all kinds of things, all kinds of articles. First one I found said four things. It said, to be a good neighbor, you have to keep your yard maintained. I thought, okay, check. I mow my grass. I did it just that, that yesterday. Secondly, take out your garbage on the right day. Yep, almost always do that. Keep your pets quiet and under control. We don't have a pet. So that's good. Be respectful with regard to noise. You know, all our boys are gone. We're pretty quiet now. Now, if that's the standard, I'm a pretty good neighbor. I was feeling good about myself. But then I found another one that said three things. Take cookies. (laughs) My wife is good at that. Me, not so much. Get to know and remember names. Oh, (laughs) I've been trying. I have like two or three. I, I... I just don't do that very well. Then thirdly, offer to help before you're asked. Well, if that's the standard, then I'm sort of an average to below average neighbor, if I'm honest. But if the standard is loving my neighbor as myself, I'm a pretty lousy neighbor. Just last week when I was mowing my grass, so trying to be a good neighbor, uh, I was mowing my grass. I was mowing the strip of grass between our sidewalk and the, the street. And the sidewalk is where or the street is where people walk their dogs. All the time in our neighborhood. Everybody has a, everybody has a pet. We don't have our, our dog. Our dog died seven, eight years ago. Um, and as I was mowing, I discovered, mowing, as I'm going along there, that one of our neighbor's dog had left me a little gift. <laughs> Only it w- wasn't a gift, and it wasn't little. Um, it meant two things. First, it meant that one of my neighbors, I mean, you don't drive to another neighborhood to walk your dog. This is somebody who lives really close to me. <laughs> had, had, had been walking their dog, let it, let it, you know, do its business in my yard, and then just walked away. Didn't have the little bag, you know, violating all neighborly etiquette. Secondly, it meant I was going to have to clean that up. Well, we don't even have a dog anymore. Love your neighbor as yourself. Really? I didn't feel very loving in that moment. I didn't want to love that neighbor. In fact, I was thinking about putting a little sign, leaving it there, putting a little sign. <laughs> Don't laugh. I know, I know you, you do the same thing. If I were to ask you, have you been nice to your neighbor, you'd probably say, yeah, yeah, I'm good. I've been pretty nice. Quiet at night. If I ask you, have you been a decent neighbor, you'd say, yeah, I guess so. If I say, have you loved your neighbor as yourself? And then I define neighbor as that guy whose dog did that. Eh, Well, not really. 
Here we see Jesus giving a loaded answer to a loaded question, and now he gives a loaded challenge. A loaded challenge. Let me take you back to your school days. I don't know how far back you have to go, but think, you know, middle school, high school, maybe even, maybe even college. But your teacher's covering some subject, let's say it's uh, history or science or math, and I, and I really struggled in math because I just, I just didn't like it and didn't pay attention. Um, sooner or later, somebody will raise their hand. Usually it wasn't me because I hated to raise my hand in class, but somebody would raise their hand, and somebody would ask the question that everybody in the class wants to ask, right? And here's the question. Do we have to know that for the test, <laughs> right? That's what you want to know. Do I have to put that little piece of information... Uh, in that part of my brain where I can remember it just long enough to check the box and to get the right multiple choice question right or to get it right in the test, and then it'll be long gone, like almost every math class I ever took, long gone. All right? Do we have to know that for the test? Now, compare that to my experience as a, as a, as a high school guy playing on the football team. When the coach gave, uh, taught you a play to run, he wasn't giving you that, that information, the name of that play, so you could get it right on a test. You had to be able to execute that on the field of play or someone else got tackled and they would see it all on film. You had to be able to execute the play. So the religious lawyer asks the question. Jesus gives a loaded answer. The lawyer answers by quoting scripture, love God, love your neighbor. And then Jesus says this, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. So, the guy knew the answer. He could pass the written test. He could check the right box, but we must see this. Jesus wasn't asking him if he knew what God wanted at the intellectual level. He wasn't asking him if he could quote scripture. He wasn't asking him if he could pass a written test. He was asking if the man does what the command says. Does he do what the command requires? Does he obey the Lord his God? Now, we need to see what Jesus is doing here. When he says, do this and live, he's saying two things. First, he's agreeing with the law of God. Everything God wants for us is summarized in those two commandments. Love God, love your neighbor. But he's also confronting this man's assumptions, and he's confronting his hypocrisy. Because he knows this man, smart as he is, Religious lawyer that he is has not obeyed these commands fully. In fact, no one has. No one can. No one has ever successfully obeyed all ten of those commandments every day of their lives. Jesus is raising the bar of obedience to a level that is unattainable. Jesus has answered the trap with his own trap. That is, he's cornered the man with his own question. Now, here's the point. The purpose of the law is not to save. The purpose of the law of God is not to grant eternal life, but to convict. The purpose of the law is to lead us to grace. The Apostle Paul teaches us this in Romans chapter 3. He writes, therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by works of the law. Through the law, we become conscious of our sin. So this conversation should lead this religious lawyer to a moment of honesty, confession, and repentance. Instead, look what happens in verse 29. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Now, we're going to look at the, what comes next, the parable of the Good Samaritan in a couple of weeks. We're going to answer the question, who is my neighbor? But here he knows he's caught. He knows Jesus has him, so the lawyer changes the subject. Right? Let's not talk about that. Let's talk about this. He knows he hasn't lived up to the command, so he's looking for a loophole. And I think we can all see ourselves a little bit in this religious lawyer. Um, this week I was, I, I was listening to the radio and I heard this story. I almost couldn't believe it was true that it happened this week when we were talking about neighboring. But then I looked it up and there's a, it, it happened in Australia. 
uh, it was in newspapers in Australia. And here's the story. Um, two neighbors got into a dispute in Australia. One was a woman who is a vegan who only eats, I guess that means only eats vegetables. And she lived next door to a man uh, who was a carnivore who, who, and who liked to grill out and barbecue in his backyard. And the woman who was a vegan uh, filed a lawsuit against him for grilling fish in his backyard because she couldn't stand the smell of fish and it was ruining her life. And that lawsuit went all the way to the Supreme Court of Australia. Okay? Then it got thrown out. So filing the lawsuit was probably not a very neighborly thing to do. Maybe you can have a conversation or something. So then how does the neighbor react, the, the, the guy who liked to grill fish? Did he, did he you know, go over and, and like have a conversation, understand her better, maybe find some way to compromise? No, he invited over a thousand people to his house for a giant cookout. Just to mock the lady and to make her life miserable. Not good neighboring, right? Truth is, most of us find it easy to love our neighbor when they're like us. When they like the things we like, when they behave like we behave, when they do the things we would approve of. And most of us struggle a bit more when our neighbor is not like us. Now this little story introduces our series because it tells us what God cares about most. That we love him and that we love our neighbors. At the heart of the story is the truth that we cannot love God without loving our neighbor. Nor can we love our neighbor without loving God. That's the powerful truth at the center of this little story. And it's what we're going to be talking about for the next three weeks. The truth is we fall short in both areas. Loving God and loving our neighbor. We just do. And we need help. We need to be transformed by the grace of Christ. The one who comes to us where we are, loves us as we are, offers hit to live his life in and through us that we can learn increasingly to love God and love our neighbor. We're going to close our service with a time of communion at the table. And the bread and the cup are to remind us of what Paul says in Romans chapter 5 when he writes, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We bow with me as I close. Lord, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for this clear reminder of what matters most to you. Thank you for reminding us that we cannot love you without loving also our neighbor. And that we cannot love our neighbor without loving you. In fact, we cannot love at all without knowing your great love for us. So thank you now for this bread and cup that remind us of your great grace that saves and transforms. It's in your name that we pray.